there's this incredible and you know devastating thing happening in the Alps and the mountains of Switzerland. Over the last hundred years or so, the ice has been disappearing before our very eyes. I mean, glaciers are losing kilometers of ice. I mean, we are losing incredible volumes. So most people, even though they are aware of climate change, they've never actually seen it with their very own eyes. I became really fascinated by trying to make pictures to help people understand the real magnitude and what is really at stake. What are we going to lose if it's going to be business as usual for the next 10 or 20 or 30 years? My name is Thomas Peshak. I'm a wildlife and conservation photographer and a Nikon ambassador. I mainly work on ocean, marine, and remote island ecosystems. I knew from age 10 I wanted to dedicate my entire life to the seas of this planet. But you know, early on, not as a photographer, I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I loved it. Undergraduate marine biology, graduate work in South Africa, working on both seagrass ecosystem and kelp forests. And during my research, I was making photographs, but not to publish. I was making them to, you know, use in scientific presentations. All of a sudden, I was telling the same story in a different way, and people just woke up. I'd achieved more with a few photographs than I had with scientific statistics and literature and, and reports over many, many years. I made a really, really tough decision and I walked away from the research to, you know, pursue the life of a nomadic photojournalist. In the first couple of years I lived in my Land Rover and I pretty much documented and specialized only in the coasts and oceans of Southern Africa. I spent half my year photographing some of the most beautiful and amazing places on our planet. I mean, really just pristine ecosystems that just make you want to cry for happiness. And you know, and that's great, but when you show only these beautiful ecosystems, people think, well, that's wonderful. The ocean is intact, everything's great. I can eat any fish I want, I can pollute. I don't have to change my, my behavior, everything's wonderful. So the other half of the year, I do environmental war photography. I document the, the darker side of our relationship with the ocean, you know, the impacts of overfishing and climate change and marine pollution and things like that. And those are images that are often hard to look at. And if I only show those images, you know, people will go, yeah, you're right. This is terrible, but what's the point? Things are so bad, what can I do as an individual? You want to give people a real way that they can make a difference by showing them other people, inspiring individuals, researchers, conservationists in action, you know, dedicating their lives to change things for the better. And I think if you leave people with that note, they will get inspired by the work of the other people and they will change and make hard decisions themselves. Part of a of a melting glacier. Wow. Let's go. Let's go make some uh, some photographs. What on earth is a ocean photographer like me doing, hundreds of k's away from the sea, on a mountain in an ice cave? I'm currently on assignment for Nikon in the Swiss Alps to tell an exciting and really critical story. As a conservation photographer, I would wish for a time machine. And the next best thing are old historical photographs. So for you know, a week or two, I searched the archives and looking for, for photographs taken you know, of various glaciers across Switzerland. And um, I came across one picture in particular that really inspired me. I found this old picture of these two geologists, you know, measuring this glacier. I mean, you have the Gorner Gletscher on the left, you have the Grenz Gletscher merging with it. I mean, that is a scene dominated by ice. I knew that a lot of that ice today no longer exists. So I was thinking, you know what? What if we can find that exact same location? What if we can stand at this same spot 50 or 60 or 70 years later? Could we capture that contrast? Luckily, 
that area is surrounded by a lot of tall mountains, you know, the Monte Rosa Massif, the Brighthorn. So you can use these mountain peaks to kind of orientate where you are. So, you know, you know, cameras in the backpack and this picture in hand, I began this search for this elusive rock, which these geologists use to actually you know, make their measurements. This is surprisingly tricky. <laughs> which face? So that's, see, so that's that ridge and that, okay, so it's a pretty obvious spot. Yeah, the shape's just different. It's just a different, I mean, I still don't think this is the right place. What ridge line is this? All right, let's keep looking because I want that exact rock. You know, a wild goose chase like this really illustrates how, how little time I actually spend on actually making the photograph. I mean, we're gonna spend probably two to three or four hours just looking for where the photograph that is that I wanna make. And I'm feeling the altitude today. Like 3,000 meters is surprisingly thin air up here. You know, after a lot of up and down and a lot of looking and searching, um, we, we actually came across the exact same rock. I will give you my house if that's not that rock. All the landmarks are lining up still really nicely. You know, the, the edge of that ridge, the peak. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I mean, I, I'd almost say that in the lower half of the Grenzgletscher and the Gorner Gletscher, there's probably less than half the ice left that I can see on this picture. I mean, the ice ran all the way continuously. I mean, all those slopes, everything just ran throughout that ravine. And now there's this big gaping rock desert. I had you know, people take up the positions of the two geologists, which means we have, we literally have a tripod in the same position. We have the one person, we have, so I tried to really match all the elements in terms of the composition and where the mountains are to kind of really draw attention to the fact that this is the same place. I believe that each picture I take has to have its own story. You know, and having just one image that's re-photographed, it lacks that. People have to look at two things side by side. So basically have both the old picture and the new scene in one frame. This photograph ended up being a collaboration with the wind. Pushing the photograph into the wind and have the wind blowing it back to me resulted in movement. And using a slower shutter speed, I was able to capture the movement of that picture. It felt much more like what I was seeing with my own eyes you know, on that glacier that day. I'm a photographer who likes to keep things simple. I'm not a big gear head, I'm not a gear nerd. So in my cameras, I needed to be this reliable old friend that I really know incredibly well. So when Nikon came to me and said, hey, we would like you to try our new mirrorless camera, I thought, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> I love my DSLRs. I have very little interest in going to mirrorless because my previous experience have been very lukewarm. I don't think I can do my job with a mirrorless camera. Sure of themselves, borderline cocky actually, telling me that you are gonna love this camera. This camera will change your life. Those are big words. You might eat them later on. So about three days ago, I got to work with a Z9 for the very, very first time. I'm the one eating my words now because literally that camera is a game changer. 
it is the best of a DSLR and the best of mirrorless combined in a rugged package. You know, for a person who shot professional DSLRs for as long as he can remember, holding one of these cameras is intuitive. I know instinctively where all the buttons are. It feels the same. There were moments when I thought I was shooting with a D5. It felt familiar like my old friend. You know, I eat equipment for breakfast. The environments I'm in is just designed to destroy lenses and cameras. And it is built like a tank. It is solid and I am fairly certain that it's gonna be hard for me to destroy this camera. I love a optical viewfinder. I, I love just being able to see the world the way it really is. I thought that would be the deal breaker. No matter how good the camera is and how rugged it is, I was gonna have to compromise with that. And I'll be honest, after two minutes of working with it, I actually forgot that it was an electronic viewfinder. It is so lifelike and so responsive and just so real, I couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> I sometimes spend weeks searching for a picture. In that minute, the gear better work. Speed is lightning quick, and the buffer really seems endless. I'm able to capture the entire bit of action without worrying about running out of space. I am going to move to mirrorless. I was super skeptical, and um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a home run. And I think it's gonna you know, forever change how I make photographs. I can't just make a picture illustrating how much the glacier had receded. I needed to also inspire people and get people to get really excited and really care about this glacier ecosystem. You know, the glacier melts every summer more and more and more. And water, rivers begin to run on top of the glacier in the summer months. And the warmer it gets, the more water flows down the glacier. And water always looks for the easiest path, which means when the water comes to a crack in the ice or a crevasse, it goes downwards. It creates these glacier caves. It creates these incredible underground magical worlds. Most people only see the glacier from the outside. They see this white, featureless, you know, you know, almost geological feature. And here's an opportunity to show people what a glacier looks like from the inside, which truly is the most magical part. So it's gonna be very hard for people to understand how this alien world connects with the world that they know. So I was looking for a cave with a opening where I could see a feature that people knew what it was. I wanted a mountain. And then you walk around the corner and there's this, this sort of majestic opening. And centered and framed right within this opening is the Matterhorn. Wow, I mean, it's, yeah, this is, this is, this is gonna, this is gonna be really, really cool. Actually, you know what? This picture is only possible at night or in the morning because the light just basically just hits you directly in that, in that sort of westerly direction. Wow, okay. And I make a few pictures and I have a look and you know what? We can do better than this. We need to come here at night. Right now, this is too much meltwater. So I think when we come back tonight, you know, hopefully there's less water dripping, and if we get the moon through the clouds, you're gonna get the Matterhorn illuminated by the moonlight. And then we rig some lights up in this cave, and, and you know, maybe two, three, four hours later, we, we can make a, an image that I certainly have never seen before. Um, and we might also fail miserably, of course. I'm certainly excited to give this a try.
The biggest problem is going to be where to put the lights because we're going to do long exposure, high ISO. So we also can't, you know, overkill. It has to be very subtle, very, very subtle lighting. You know, it's easy to get people to fall in love with, you know, you know, lions and dolphins and, and, you know, and giraffes and cute animals, but a glacier is a, you know, you almost have to create a character around a glacier. You almost have to make, make a photograph that is so compelling and so beautiful and so magical that people care as much about a glacier as they do about an endangered animal because these glaciers are becoming endangered. By hopefully making a compelling image, we can get people to think a little bit harder about you know, what climate change actually means. And now let's get out of here before this whole thing collapses on our head and come back later when it's colder. It is, you know, amazingly beautiful in there, but it's also freezing cold. So before I get in there tonight to make the picture, I need to just rewarm and feel my fingers and feet again. <sighs> Moon comes up around 10. Like now the biggest issue is remaining warm and then once we have the moon lighting up the eastern face of the Matterhorn we we um and we go back in the cave and we try to make that picture I'm surprisingly tired but then again we are at 2,800 meters so the altitude certainly makes a difference so I think I'm gonna try to get a little bit of sleep and yeah try to get cozy So nice to be horizontal <sighs> and warm. Oh, yeah. Turn. Okay. You get into this cave at night and it is pitch black. You hear, you know, the water dripping, you hear the river running, you sometimes hear the ice creaking, you hear rock falling. It's a very eerie place to be. Now I need to bring light into the cave because the moonlight is hitting the Matterhorn. It is not, you know, illuminating the cave at all. With lighting, the key is not what you light. The key is what you decide not to light to give it a really third dimension. And this, and this cave was 20, 30 meters high. There was multiple tunnels and entrances. So um, we had you know, five different lights in the passages, you know, backlighting, you know, big blocks of ice. And all of a sudden, one by one, picture by picture, different parts of the cave are coming alive. You know, I'm doing long exposures, probably 10 second exposures. And right at the end, I use my head torch to kind of light up the, the, uh, the roof of the cave. And that just kind of gives it sort of a nice, in an overview, in a glow. People have no idea of the scale of this place. What if our mountain guide, you know, climbs up one of the ice walls, you know, right in the picture to give this whole scene some scale. You try different positions, he climbs, we do it, and all of a sudden he's just in this position where he just perfectly balances out the Matterhorn, everything comes together. I take a last final picture, I look at the view and I go, this is it. I think it illustrates how, how beautiful and magnificent and how iconic a glacier can be. And it will hopefully show people a glacier in a way that they've never seen it before. To me, it also illustrates that us humans, in terms of size, we are incredibly small compared to the sheer grandeur and scale of the natural world. Yet, collectively, 
we have caused this magnificent and gigantic glacier to recede and almost disappear. The one picture speaks of the beauty of the ice ecosystem. It speaks of how small and insignificant we really are in terms of scale. And the other picture shows to me how even though individually we're small in scale, collectively in numbers, we have, you know, caused this majestic, massive glacier to almost disappear.